I am Ira Victor. I am one of you. I have been coming to B-Sides since it actually was open to the public. Um, when, it went, when it left someone's house and actually went as a public event. I have been coming, as Josh knows, to I Am The Cavalry since Josh started I Am The Cavalry. So I am literally one of you. I have been going, my, my first DEF CON was DEF CON 10. So I have been um, immersed in information security for a long time. It is an honor to be here and present to you and to answer. I, I didn't know about the, present, the, the slides for this last presentation. I sat through it with as much interest as all of you did. And it is wonderful. I'm going to credit to Josh and his people for putting me after the first presentation. I don't know if it was planned, but I'm going to answer a lot of those questions in that presentation. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, I, I do work in uh, digital forensics and incident response. I am part of my pro bono time. It's not just here for you, as I am the cavalry, but I am an ambassador for the Center for Internet Security Controls. And as this unfolds, you'll find out more about that and what, this, what it has to do with our talk. I'm also going to give you the precursors to look for when vendors sell you what they, what they tell you will answer your problems, but what to look for to know that that's not what, what you're buying. You're buying something else. So there's a tease for what's coming up here. Uh, I'm, this, this is another crazy coincidence. I did name this Security Trek The Next Generation. Uh, I did not know that this past weekend was the Star Trek convention. It actually ended the day before yesterday. Someone asked me if that was planned. It wasn't. But I went with it. So Stardate 323320.55, which was 25 years ago today on Stardate. And what we were doing as an information security community was we were trying to educate mainstream users about information security and digital privacy. And most people, I've been around long enough to know, gave us blank stares. What the heck are you talking about? I remember that. And what we wanted to do at B-Sides, DEF CON, Black Hat, RSA, ShmooCon, what we wanted to do was protect against cyber criminals, nation state spying, financial fraud. Um, so we had attacks. How many of you remember, I love you? Some really, really bad cyber attack. And then we had the early ransomware. One of them was called CryptoLocker, WannaCry. Um, and, and there are many, many more. I actually had to go to look those up because I was going to put code red in there. There were so many old attacks back then. Uh, that we were trying to educate the world about. So I actually think we've made great progress. I know we have a lot to do, but Josh's announcement today was an example about the great progress that we've made, that there's now going to be a publicity effort around awareness and information security. Even the fact, Josh, that you could have that conversation and not get blank stares, right? That's a change from when, we, when I Am The Cavalry was started. Right? I think that's great. So what I, my, my opinion is, mission accomplished, sort of, sort of. My thesis is, what we've, what we've helped uh, train people outside of our community is that the threat is no longer abstract. People now realize that it is a real threat. That's good. That's, that's a big improvement. But now the challenge is, how do we persuade the mainstream users that their systems and the things that they're doing in their life need to be secured? They're aware of it, but they're not quite sure what, what the heck do we do now? Um, a lot of times I've been told uh, when I'm doing public speaking or I'm having media appearances, um, said, Ira, you've just scared the heck out of me, the, the person interviewing me on TV. Ira, you've scared the heck out of me. And what I want to say is, okay, well, that's good, but now we need to take, take that fear and make it something of action. And that's what I, I consider the, the people in the, in the 21st century that have been involved in the security community, that's everybody here in the room, people watching on video, um, have probably been involved in information security to some extent, 
uh, in the 20th century. That's our generation, broadly speaking. So the question is, what do we teach the next generation? What are we going to do to have security for the next generation? And how do we harness this? So a couple of challenges. Um, small organizations often cannot afford in-house IT, let alone information security. And that could be, that could, I want to broadly define what's small, you know, less than 500 employees. It might be a division of a larger company with less than 500 employees and spare, spare resources, right? Like a law enforcement department might be part of a, a large entity legally, but, I uh, see so you were in light rail, weren't you, sir? I was looking at you, in light rail. So you, you may be part of a larger government entity, but your group is, would be considered small on its own and what your budgets are. I still count that as a smaller organization. Challenging to have in-house, to afford good in-house IT. Good in-house, you know, great that, that your organization, sir, has a CISO. A lot of them don't. It's just voice it on IT. I further, I'm gonna ruffle some feathers here, but I actually believe that a cybersecurity degree may not really adequately prepare graduates to defend against real world threats. How many of you know someone that has a degree in, in information security um, uh, and says, I can't get a job? Because they say, I have no experience. And I tell them, well, I have a degree. And they go, right, you have no experience. And so we've got a lot of people with degrees, but they're not actually getting hired in their field of choice. Why, you know, how do we fix that? Because that's someone that has that awareness. How do we harness that and fix that? And um, I think that part of what, it ha what the, one of the keys that's missing, my thesis is one of the keys that's missing in this pillar is practical real world response. And when I tell that to people that have a degree, like, well, Ira, can you, can you hire me on one of your projects so I can get some experience? And, and, and I can't get any experience, so when I apply, I have no experience, what, what do I do? I'll answer that question. I will answer that question. So my, what I want to impress upon you is all of us, all of us that have been in the information security community in the 21st century, we have, I call this the, for the first generation. We have, because we know this stuff, we know how bad things can be. We have an ethical obligation to equip the next generation with the tools and knowledge to complete the mission. Okay, yeah, great. Sounds great, Ira. Lots of platitudes. Thanks a lot. Bye. I'll see you later. Now, I'm going to tell you how we do that. Tell you how I'm doing it and how all of you can be part of that. So I, I propose that we need a radical change in our attitudes toward information security to complete the mission. Number one, information security is not about products primarily. It's primarily about process. Just, just before this talk, I was, you know, my phone is going off. That is so embarrassing. I can't tell you how embarrassed I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably am turning red, Ashley. Um, uh, the, the, uh, there are huge litigation that's happening right now between the airline industry and the tech companies over the massive outage that recently happened. I just was reading it this morning. Swear to God, one of the major airlines said, we spent billion, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, it's a long story. We spent billions of dollars on product. It's not our fault. This is the problem. The CEO says, we spent billions of dollars on product. So I'm sorry to keep pointing out because it was so great in light rail. We spent billions of dollars on some stuff. We, but it's not solving the problem. That's exactly right, because it's about process primarily, not about product. In order for us to empower the next generation, we have to share our experiences. All of us, you're shaking your heads, right? We spent, we're spending, we spent a quarter million dollars buying this widget, this black box, and we wrapped it up, and that's got all the blinky lights. It must be doing something. And we spent tens of thousands of dollars on something as a service for this. And then our whole infrastructure craps out and we lose half a billion dollars. It's a particular airline I'm, I'm referencing. 
And they go, well, we, how can this happen? We, we're going to go sue everyone because we spent all this money. So first in this, and to, again, I'm going to come back to you, sir, in light. What is your first name, sir? My name's Andy. Andy, I hope you don't mind me using it because it was so awesome, your last question. So one of the elements is we need to change our understanding, have a better understanding, and all of us in the community have a, have a better understanding about what open source is. Practical, hands-on, and what it is and what it can't do. Because Andy, part of the answer to your question is not, lo is not vendor lock-in. That's not the answer to the question about what do we do when we, our, our needs change, but we're locked into hard to something as a service and some blinky light box in our rack. And then the next, the, all, all of this, the all, part of this is also a public education challenge. And now I understand why Josh and his team liked my proposal today because that was in it before I saw the, the last talk. All right, now here's the big tell. The big, as a matter of fact, if there's, if there's a few things you take from this talk today and nothing else, this is one of them right here. I, this is from directly from my experience being in the community. What are the telltale signs that uh, a decision is being made to substitute information security true information security for just buying product. That it's not product, it's process. Is you look for the companies that boast to the investor community that their crap is going to have a revenue hockey stick. How many have heard of the revenue hockey stick? Okay, look it up. I did not make this up. It's when the business's strategies are more geared to the investor community than the users and the customers. And what they want is they want to they wanna convince people that buy our, buy our blinky lights, buy our XYZ as a service, and your problems will be solved. And what they're doing is they're signing up all these people so they can get this revenue hockey stick where they start at the bottom, where a few customers, and then they ramp everything up. There's a certain security company that had a big outage that was a big fan of the revenue hockey stick. Now this is all publicly available information. The investor community, to their credit, expose what they do. They do not hide this. So you look and say, do I see the telltale signs? Do I see them say the revenue hockey stick, that we've tripled our revenue in the last X number of months? That's the revenue hockey stick. They're focused on investors, not on users, not on security, not on process, on investors. And I'll give you another telltale sign. Call, before you make a decision to buy the blinky light, or someone's gonna make the decision, and you're in the team, to buy the blinky light box and the service, call up, use a little social engineering skills. Call up and pretend to be a customer. Can you talk to a real person? Are they really knowledgeable about information security? Are they knowledgeable about process? Or are they just there to facilitate the hockey stick? If they're just there to facilitate the hockey stick, don't walk, run. Or at least advise someone that if you were in the position to make a decision, you wouldn't walk, you'd run. Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, one of those times that I made those calls on behalf of a client, I swear to God, the person I talked to, and I said, well, why don't you do it this way? I got to someone knowledgeable. They said, well, that would be too difficult for us. It was something very simple about process. Yeah, because too difficult because they're focused on the revenue hockey stick. Look for those signs, walk away. And boy, the market works. If, 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 all of, if enough of us, doesn't be all of us, if enough of us in the information security community push back against the vendors, push back, look at my last bullet point. When they have their meetings internally, I've been in these meetings by the way, when they have their meetings and, you, and someone talks about process, about that being important for the, for the company, yeah, but Ira, we don't get the revenue hockey stick that way. You're not thinking big enough. And I was dismissed, uh, not, psych, not physically, psychologically dismissed what I was saying. Market pressure can change that. When the revenue hockey stick doesn't hockey stick, that's how, we st that's how that, that change starts to happen. 
So outsourced IT, I know some of you, I, I'm an outsourced digital forensics and incident response professional. My brethren in outsourced IT, there are probably some of you here are watching. I'm sorry to say, you guys and gals, you're focused too much on selling product when it comes to information security, not process. Please, be, I am the cavalry. Be the cavalry that changes that because it's about more about information security and privacy is more about process than buying products. Secondly, what goes for security awareness training is looking at antiquated attacks. It's generic and it's teaching people about attacks that don't even happen uh, or haven't happened for a long time. Uh, so that's another challenge that, that we need to conquer and I have an answer to that. Um, and again, I'm gonna come back to this bias against open source. There's a, among non-technical people, there is this response that I see that if it's open source, that means that all my data is open. I'm like, mm, no, that's not how it works. But it's, those of us in this community, I'm seeing the shaking heads. We have to be the cavalry. I am the cavalry and stand up in the room and says, no, in the room, no, that's not what open source is. It's a misunderstanding. That's not the part that's open. It's not what we mean. When we say open source, that's not what we mean. Uh, so I want to take a break here. Uh, uh, I did title my talk, uh, Security Trek, The Next Generation. And one of the things that I found interesting about being a Star Trek fan is that when you have a security issue that you need to explain to someone, a lay person, there's almost always a Star Trek episode that has the issue. And I came up with two examples. Um, one is CrowdStrike, son of a gun, in The Schizoid Man. That's in Star Trek The Next Generation, Series 2, Episode 6. Season 2, pardon me, Episode 6. Data, there's incompatible, in essence, I'm summarizing a long plot, incompatible code is loaded into data that almost causes a catastrophe on the enterprise. Sound familiar? Great way to explain it. Now, just as a personal sidebar, and I'm always, I want to talk about the community, but my name, Ira, is not a very common name. The, may, the protagonist in this episode is Dr. Ira Graves. It's so cool. Uh, the, um, and I remember when this episode aired, actually, because the guy's name was Ira. Uh, CDK Global. Now, CDK Global has kind of been washed out of the headlines because of the crowd strike, but it actually had a bigger impact in many ways than CrowdStrike did. Over half of the consumer and, and commercial uh, vehicle business is uh, powered by or uses CDK, CDK Global's uh, software. This is a company by their own website says that they do, they're an expert in everything related to technology, marketing, CRM, Salesforce automation, promotion, uh, search engine optimization will run your whole IT and we're experts at information security. In my opinion, hogwash. They were acquired by private equity and that private equity company, in, in my observations of publicly available information, were obsessed with the hockey stick. And so they got hit by a really bad ransomware attack and because a lot of dealers had all their eggs in the CDK basket because CDK promised, we'll take care of everything. They went down hard. As hard as, as some of the airlines did, they went down. And it affected thousands and thousands of businesses across the country. Now, there's an episode called Gambit, part one and two, also Star Trek The Next Generation, season seven, episode four and five, where Captain Picard is held ransom. And they go over a lot of the issues and challenges for ransom. What a, I do this, everyone. Yes, it's kind of fun to do it, but also this is how we have to explain to the layperson. This is not something kind of, we don't understand what to do, related to people in, in ways that they can understand. Um, one other little fun, cool thing. I found that picture with Picard and some other, some other character. Um, have a little fun today at B-Sides. Look for a person who has hair like that. I promise you there are people here at B-Sides that has a haircut like that, somewhere here. 
All right. So what did what did I do? What have what have we done? And actually, I'm gonna you get ready to stand up because I'm here with someone to help me today. So what what I did with a group of people about 17 years ago is we set up a Lions Club with one project. Lions Clubs are uh, over 100-year-old service organizations. They're all across the country, all across the world, and they usually get involved, each club, in multiple service causes in their community. We have one cause. It's the Computers for Kids Club. What we do is we recruit volunteers to help run the club. It's 100% volunteer. We service kids in the community that have no computers at home. And we educate them about open source, privacy, and security. Everyone, we have educated in the last 17 years 15,000 students and their parents about open source, information security, and privacy. 15,000, 100% volunteer. We are people in our community that care about this and we, I am the cavalry spirit. We are the cavalry. We did it. And we service K through 12 students. We, no, we, we require the students to take training for this and we require them to come with their parents so their parents learn about security and privacy and the children learn about security and privacy. Ashley, stand up. Ashley is our president of our chapter. Thank you, Ashley. And she helped me, she helped me so much today in, 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 in logistics and things. So she, she's awesome. But Ashley's an example of not only that we're helping kids, we're bringing people in. Ashley was not in the information security community, but she wanted to be. So we bring in adults, young adults, but also people that are going through career changes that have the problem of, I can't get hired to do secure InfoSec because I have no experience. We give them, we, the, by going through as an adult, going through our program, the, our members get real world experience in information security and privacy that then is directly applicable into the job market. We, um, I, I am proud to say that our current vice president uh, Jenna is her name. She was working at Walmart driving a forklift when she joined our club. She has left the employment of Walmart and now she works for a, a high tech company doing work in our field. And one of the elements was what she did in our Computers for Kids Club because it gave her experience so she could jump out of that forklift job. Um, and we have a multi-step approach to training that covers hardware and software, and we're doing it in Reno, but we have, because we're part of Alliance Club, we can scale this to anywhere any of you are in the world. And I'll tell you about that in a moment, but I also have a big announcement. This right here, in this room, all of you that are watching this, this is the worldwide announcement of the first desktop operating system that is compliant with the Center for Internet Security Controls for Security and Privacy. Free open source software. It is going to be launched at the end of this year. And we partnered with the, the our Computers for Kids Club, we partnered with the Center for Internet Security so that we're the test bed. And for people that want to get involved in this, there's an opportunity, if you're already in information security, to burnish your resume. If you know people that want experience to get involved in this program, to be part of, this, of the launch of this desktop operating system. Free open source, everyone. Now, unlike Windows and Mac, where out of the box, the, in, in my opinion, what Microsoft and Apple has done is, is deployed millions upon millions of promiscuous devices and put it in the hands of consumers and small businesses. Shame on them. Because those devices out of the box, in my experience, are engineered to be compromised. And I'll give you just one example. I don't have, I don't have time here to go through a catalog of all the examples. I'll just give you one. 
when you pull those devices out of the box and you go to start them up, to set them up, not on an Active Directory domain, but standalone, they all run as local admin. And no instructions, like, no, like, oh, don't do this. If you want to do this, your hair is going to fall out. If that's what you really want to do. Are you sure you really want to do this? You know, when you want to delete Microsoft software, that's what they say. Your hair is going to fall out if you delete it. But they don't say, and, and Apple too is guilty of this. They don't say, hey, our devices are promiscuous and going to be compromised in moments if you run them as local admin. By the way, that's one of the CIS controls is do not run as local admin. But yet millions of these devices are deployed every day that are running in that state. So um, uh, we, this, is a, this is going to be an operating system that is designed for security and privacy out of the box and free open source. And we are going, we've been deploying our own sort of homebrew for greater security and privacy for the Computers for Kids Club and we're going to be transitioning by the end of the year to the CIS uh, version. Um, it's going to be available, I'll give you the link in a moment for CIS. You, you don't need to be part of the Lions Club, Computers for Kids Club to get that. Um, but you can work with us uh, to, to burnish your resume or know, if you know people that don't want to get involved in information security. So we, we view this, and I'll tell you how you can get involved, we view this as the hands-on experience on security process. None of it has to do with a revenue hockey stick. There's no XYZ as a service. There's no, oh, buy our proprietary box, and then it's arbitrarily end of life out of 36 months because the revenue hockey stick requires you to buy another one of their stupid boxes. None of that. We, we, this is about a culture of security and privacy process. And that allows us, that, that will allow us to finish the mission. We've started um, doing so well in getting people aware, but now we need to finish that mission and it's up to all of us, up to you to do it. So let me give you some examples here and I'll give you some contact info. I'm gonna put that up so you can take there. Now I have Ashley right here, our president. So at the end of the talk, you can come to see me, you can come to see Ashley as the president of the chapter. You can also email or send us a text. We'll send you information. Here's what we will offer to anyone that is not um, in, does not live in Northern Nevada. There are so many elements of what we do that are about process that don't require, doesn't require you to be in Northern Nevada where we live. Um, we, as a matter of fact, we were doing uh, remote meetings before any Lions Clubs in the world. <laughs> We've been doing hybrid meetings. We do a meeting, an organization meeting every week. It's always been hybrid. And we do not use Zoom. Say another second thing. The second thing to walk away from this, if nothing else, this is the second one. Do not use Zoom. It is promiscuous by design. It is promiscuous by design. There is free open source um, a video conferencing, Jitsi, and I have no connection to Jitsi. J-I-T dot S-I, Jitsi Meets. It is free like, open source free. What a concept. You can actually download Jitsi and locally host your own Jitsi little server. You, could, you can put on a little small form factor box and run your own Jitsi server, but there's also cloud Jitsi. So we meet on Jitsi once a week, or have an organization meeting for one hour once a week. And by joining our club, which means attending the meetings, and then whatever you wanna do, we have many things that need to be done. Many of them can be done remotely. We've spent 17 years ironing out the kinks of how to give out 15,000 computers just with volunteers, just a couple hints. The computers are all donated to us. So there are millions of, of insecure, compromised, promiscuous by design comp uh, desktop computer systems. Uh, I'll stick to North America, but it's the world. And by design, they're obsoleted by the tech companies that are concerned about their revenue hockey stick. 
not about security or privacy of their customer, in my opinion. We take those, those company organizations have to pay to have them hauled away. They find out about us and go, wait, you guys will come pick them up. What are you going to charge me? Nothing. Well, nothing? Like, so no, nothing. Well, what do you do with them? You just dump them out, you know, go somewhere in a river and dump them out? No, no, no. We refurbish them and we teach kids about privacy and security with open source. Wow, can you pick up three pallets next week? I kid you not. I kid you not. We get pallets of donated equipment and we take that equipment and refurbish it so it's free and we put our free open source software on it and we teach the kids. This is how we do it all with volunteers. And there's obviously with any process like this, there's lots of little steps. We know all those little steps. So if you want to get, if you want to go in your community and read about what we do, talk with us and do something on your own in your community, please do it. There are millions of these crappy, insecure systems that are being dumped in garbage dumps or sent overseas to third world countries where little kids go through the motherboards and get heavy metal through their skin. We can divert those. You can divert those. And if you want to do some version of this, please go do it. You can download the, the CIS Linux and go do it. If you want to be fostered by people that have been doing this for 17 years, come join us remotely. And then if you say, great, I learned this stuff, Ira. Now I want to do it in my community. Awesome. We'll connect you up with the Lions Club there. Wherever you are in the country, there's a Lions Club nearby. That's why we, one of the reasons that we affiliate with Lions Club, they have a structure. So we can focus on what we do. We don't have to create a whole structure legally. We do that through, the, through Lions Club International. We are recognized by Lions Club International for our innovation. We're one of the fastest growing Lions Clubs in, in this part of the country because of the innovation of what we do. So yes, we'd love you to get involved that way, but any way you want to do it, we're, 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 we're free open source people. I'm not going to stop you from doing something on your own. Whatever works for you. But if to start, my recommendation is start by participating with us for as mu much as little as you want, and you can learn from that and then decide what you want to do. Um, I also want, it would be terrible if I didn't give you Center for Internet Security. So the cisecurity.org, you will see information on their website by the end of the year about, it's actually, it's a version of Linux Mint. And I'll tell everyone, for everyone's benefit, why we chose Linux Mint. Linux Mint um, is, is a, my phone is still ringing. Son of a gun, I have two people. I thought I shut it off. God. And it's a spam call. <laughs> is that, there's some, like, significance in that, isn't there? Um, we chose Linux Mint for the CIS version of uh, the CIS compliant version of Linux. And technically, it's what we call a benchmark. So we took Linux Mint and then we added a different process for its configuration to make the CIS version of Linux. So it's Linux Mint. It's the Cinnamon desktop. And we chose that for a couple of reasons. One is, this is so awesome, everyone. For, you take, this is like the third like really important thing. User, many end users, small organizations end users, home end users, other types of people that are end users, when, you, when they get that automatic uptake to Windows 11, like, what the hell happened to my computer? Where's the start menu on the lower left, right? I'm all shaking heads, right? So the first thing we tell people is Linux Mint is more like Windows 10 by a mile. <laughs> that Windows 11 is. They're all of a sudden listening. I, we've got their attention. The parents are like, really? Where's the start button? <laughs> we'll show you where the start button is. So that we chose that also Linux Mint Cinnamon has a really big user base. So we didn't, with both our group, the Computers for Kids Club and Center for Internet Security, we didn't want, um, people to get used to a certain environment and then we had to switch them because we've all known there have been distros of Linux that have kind of come in and then faded. And we, we, one of the things we do in the Computers for Kids Club is if a student comes in with a lot of elementary school and middle school students, we tell them 
you, you can keep this computer through the end of your education, and if it breaks, bring it back. We'll either fix it or we'll give you another one. I got six pallets out back. We'll give you another one if it doesn't, if it doesn't work. So we want to keep them on the same environment through their life cycle. And Linux Mint has a very large user base, a long history, and great help menus too. So we're very conscious in why we chose Linux Mint. But and another plus, how many of you have struggled getting a printer to work in desktop Linux? I have. Oh my God. Um, Linux Mint works really well with older print, in my experience, with older printers. And we don't supply printers. Uh, it's, it's another whole space, and then there's an ink issue. So we tell people that, you know, find a printer. And Linux Mint work, works really well for newer or older printers. And it actually, a lot of times, it configures faster than Windows, which is, like, pretty freaking amazing, in my opinion. Um, so um, uh, we, this is, this is, a lot of this is due to our, you know, our close collaboration with Center for Internet Security. Another big benefit of Center for Internet Security Controls, I'm going to put on my ambassador's cap. Uh, Nevada was the third state to say that, that the definition of reasonable security, because that's the issue, and the last speaker talked a lot about risk management, and it's not, there's no risk, there's no, nothing bad's going to happen, or everything bad's going to happen. That's not what risk is about, right? We all know that. Well, the problem has been um, when there's, when there's uh, litigation, civil litigation that happens, what is, what, what, like with uh, CrowdStrike, the issue is, was the airline negligent or was CrowdStrike and Microsoft negligent? That's what it's fundamentally going to come down to. And then, then the argument is, well, we, Delta says, we had reasonable security in our systems, and CrowdStrike and Microsoft will say, well, we had reasonable security in our, in our process. And then a judge with zero information security training, typically, and a jury with zero information security training is, go is going to arbitrate what is reasonable security. Holy moly! $500 million loss by Delta is going to be arbitrated by people that have no training in information security. That's really bad. So there's been a movement to define what reasonable security is. Nevada was the third state to say the Center for Internet Security Controls defines what is reasonable security. I wrote that law, got that put in. That's how I became the ambassador, actually. They called me after that law was passed and created this ambassador program. Now about 12 states have some version of this, um, and there are no states that contradict it. That's really important legally. No state says, no, we don't, we don't accept Center for Internet Security. So all of you here, that's, so this is the fourth thing that's really important. Whether you get involved with us or not in some way, I hope you do, but if you don't, understanding what reasonable security is, what's the definition of reasonable security, and it is now in more and more jurisdictions, the Center for Internet Security Controls, which, no surprise, is more about process than buying products and works really well with open source. So I encourage you to look at that. There also is a guide. If you go, if you do a search, um, just a regular DuckDuckGo search, not that other company that everybody heard of, DuckDuckGo search, and type in reasonable security guide, Center for Internet Security. There is a guide now, so you can take that to management to justify process over product. And there's a guide for that. I'll get to your question in just a moment. So um, I encourage you to do that. And I'm going to, I know I'm, 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 we're, I'm, near, I'm rounding third here. So here's the contact information for the, for the Computers for Kids Club. Um, also, if you liked this talk, I'm happy that you did. It's been an honor. And thank you, Josh, for allowing me to speak today. It's been an honor to be amongst m my friends um, and present to you today. I am doing, uh, after this talk was approved, I was asked to give a talk at another conference. It's a virtual conference. I'm going to give a version of this talk. If you know people that would like what I talk about, they can go to pficconference.com. There's a virtual conference on InfoSec and digital forensics on August 21st. There's no charge. It is, they've, it's, it's free like open source. And you can sign up. I am giving the noon Eastern time talk. It's a version of this. 
You can have people have asked me, can I just log in just to watch this talk you have, Ira? Absolutely, you can log in and you can share this with other people that way. So I hope you didn't mind, Josh, me, me plugging that. Um, and so I've got just a few more minutes. You had a question. Thank you. So my name is Angelica and I'm IT examiner for the state for the uh, Department of Financial Institutions. I'm also a SOC examiner. When you're saying process over the product, I had many credit unions telling me, like, I'm like, what's your due diligence process? And they said, they say all the things, but then it's, if they don't have SOC 2 report, first of all, we don't really know how to read it. Second yeah. of all, if they have exceptions, what do we supposed to do with that? Yep. Third of all, we send them security questionnaire. It's so hard to get them into sending it back to us. Yes. Fourth, we get the security yes. questionnaire. Yes. And so I, full disclosure, I, I am the acting CISO for a credit union mm -hmm. uh, as a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know this inside and out. Yeah. Please have them. Uh, I, we had no pushback from the auditors and the reg regulators with the adoption of Center for Internet Security. And it's a cookbook. Mm -hmm. And the board bought it, you know, bought the idea. And part of it was, it's not about buying more blinky light boxes and s X as a service. It's, it's about process and they could understand that. Okay. Okay, and I, 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 I hope somebody here knows about the credit union that, that went down in Northern California, because I don't know anyone from that credit union and boy do they need they need this answer. Second thing, the yes. computers for Kids Club, is it just for kids or also if I have the credit union members, they're like, can so, they also sign up? Yes, so things? great question. So we give the computers to the kids locally, but every, adults can, can and should join. Listen, I've been doing it for 17 years. I learn stuff by teaching, by tackling new challenges. I say, can, hey, Ira, can you help tackle that? Yeah, I'll tackle that. That makes me better. I advance my skill set. And the, the benefit is when I do that with a credit union, I gotta be really careful. Because it's regulated and I have to, you know, I can't go off too far off the reservation. But with the Computers for Kids Club, I say, hey, you know, I think I have a new way to do this. We could do it this, this, and this way. Can we try that? And, and then generally people say, yeah, let's give that a try. Because the, it's not the risk of a, of a you know, credit union or a bank. It's a Computers for Kids Club. So it's a really great way to get real world experience, but to push yourself. So yes, adults in the credit union can join. That will give them secure, their great security training and awareness by being involved in the, in the club. Great question. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Do I have other yeah, questions? Time for one more question. One more. All right. You know what? That'll give time for the next speaker to set up. I'm going to be around for a little bit. Please come find me. Come to Stand Up Again, Ashley. Talk to Ashley, and uh, we'll, we'll answer any of your questions one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you again, everyone. Please Thank you, Josh. Thank you.